everybody a couple moments to trickle back in from coffee, uh, during which time I would like to introduce our first keynote for the day. I'm delighted that we can be joined here by Julia Angwin. Julia founded the markup to provide, produce full data-centered journalism about technology and the people affected by it. So her voice today is in some ways the missing link between platform transparency, technological transparency, um, uh, other individualized forms of transparency, and potential catalysis for policy change. Before founding the markup, Julia Angwin led investigative teams at ProPublica and the Wall Street Journal author of the book Dragnet Nation, A Quest for Privacy, Security, and Freedom in the World of Relentless Surveillance, and Stealing MySpace, The Battle to Control the Most Popular Website in America. She has a BA in Mathematics from the University of Chicago and an MBA from Columbia University. Julia Angwin is a winner and two-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Journalism. So the way that we'll format this today is that we'll hear from Julia first for roughly 30 to 40 minutes, after which I'll ask a few introductory questions, and then we will turn it over to you, the audience. So please keep your questions in mind. Thank you. Hello. It's great to be here. Um, I'm hoping you can all hear me. And I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there in person. I really wanted to be. Um, I've been many times to Silicon Flatirons and loved it and loved the conference. Um, it feels like today is a great day to be talking about tech and transparency. Um, if there is any lesson from this week on Twitter, it feels like the one thing maybe we could all agree on is that having one billionaire make all decisions about speech, governance, and public discourse is maybe not the optimal choice. So um, I think there are a lot of ways to solve this, like Margot was saying, and um, you guys I'm sure are talking all about policy and technological issues. I wanna talk about the role of journalism and the journalists and how we try to hold tech accountable for the decisions that they make that are often hidden behind an algorithm. And so I've been writing um, about uh, privacy, algorithmic bias, et cetera, for more than a decade and leading teams of engineers who have done algorithmic audits. And I wanted to put together a little talk about sort of like, what does it take to do that type of accountability work? Um, because I think we need much more of it. So I'm going to um, try to share my screen. Um, I want to talk about what it would take to do, what it does take to do better journalism in the algorithmic age, because I think we're going to need a lot more of it. So um, basically, I just tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Silicon Valley. I started programming in fifth grade. I was part of an early generation that, you know, used Apple II and really just loved um, the it was called the personal computer revolution at that time. And I really thought that I would actually go into the tech industry, but I fell in love with my college newspaper and decided to try journalism for a little while. So I ended up at the Wall Street Journal for 14 years, ProPublica for four years, and then founding the markup four years ago. And I have started to think of what I do as mathematical journalism, which is Sounds kind of pretentious, but I think what I mean by it is using the power of math to break important stories. It's, I think, an underused piece by journalists, many of whom went into the field because they hated math. <laughs> so um, I want to just describe a few things I mean by that. So one kind of story that I think um, some of you might be familiar with was something I did at ProPublica about criminal risk score algorithms. and whether they were biased. And this was a question that legal scholars, including many at Silicon Flatirons have been raising forever, right? That the idea of coming up with a predictive score about whether someone would commit a future crime was legally questionable and very likely to be biased based on the kinds of questions that they asked. But it wasn't until we collected the data and ran the numbers that we were able to show 
that it was actually biased. So I collected 18,000 different scores. We showed that even just looking at the scores of whether a white or a black defendant was given a risk, high risk or low risk score, you can see the difference here. The white defendants were given a preponderance of low risk scores and black defendant scores were pretty evenly distributed one through 10 high risk to low risk. And so the question that raised was, are the white defendants really all just Mother Teresa or was there something else going on here? So what we needed to do was check to see whether those scores were actually correct. So we went on to check and see whether the people who had been predicted to commit a future crime in the next two years went on to commit that crime. And what we saw was there was, um, it wasn't that accurate. The score itself was actually only 60% accurate, but it was um, biased in the way that was inaccurate. So when it was wrong, it was twice as likely to label a black defendant high risk when they weren't, and twice as likely to label a white defendant as low risk when they weren't. And so basically the false positives and the false negative rates were skewed. And that kind of error is something that had not been seen before we did this type of journalism. And it did lead to a lot of soul searching in the computer science community, slightly less soul searching, unfortunately, in the criminal justice community, which still uses this score and many others like it, um, but has led to um, things like Prop 25 in California not being accepted, which was the idea that they would replace bail with these risk scores because people argued that you shouldn't replace um, bail, which is obviously a terrible system, but with a system that is known to be racist. Um, another story that I think used math to great advantage was um, a story that we did at the markup about Amazon and the question of whether they were preferencing their own brands. So basically a lot of seller, Amazon sellers had said anecdotally, look, I can't get to the top of the search results. Like if you search for batteries or staples on Amazon, you're not, we can't get to the top of those. Um, we are all down at the bottom and that means we can't sell. And so once again, we needed to do math to really prove whether this anecdotally was true. So we collected thousands of search results and then ran um, a random forest decision tree to see whether being an Amazon brand was as predictive, was predictive of being in the top. And it was high, the most predictive factor. Being an Amazon brand was the most likely factor to get you to the top of search results. Um, much higher than the things you might expect, like star ratings and the number of reviews. And so once again, this was a mathematical way to show something that people had sort of vaguely felt to be true. And it was interesting to me because I was not sure that um, lawmakers, policymakers would be able to deal with a probabilistic finding like this. But in fact, it did lead to um, the House Antitrust Committee basically saying that Amazon had lied to them when it testified that it wasn't preferencing its own brands and has asked the DOG to, to investigate them for perjury. And then finally, there's another story I thought I would just quickly mention about how um, math can really help unlock something. So Allstate is a car insurance company and they had um, been saying and still do say that they have a special secret sauce algorithm that allows them to determine whether you're a loyal customer or not. And essentially, if you're a loyal customer, this is the cool part, they'll charge you more. <laughs> so you get a penalty for being loyal because uh, they realize you're not really gonna shop around. And so they had, they had this, what they called a retention model, and they were filing information about it with different state insurance regulators. And we wanted to see, well, what, um, what was happening with this algorithm? Well, what did that loyalty look like? So once again, we ended up using a decision tree to figure out um, what did the data show? And what it showed was they had sort of a price of loyalty, which was essentially $1,900 um, premium or more meant that you were price indifferent. So they were gonna just give you a huge increase each year. And if you paid less than that, then they would decide that you were less price and you were more price sensitive, you might shop around. And so they weren't gonna try to give you a huge increase in price. And so this was actually um, something that hadn't been 
uncovered by the regulators who hadn't done this kind of analysis and hadn't been known to the public. And so, um, you know, basically they've gotten in some trouble in Texas and in California, suing them over this sort of what we called a sucker's list because the idea was if you're a sucker who they think they can just milk you for lots of money. And these are the kinds of stories you just really can't do without some mathematical literacy. And I think these are the stories of our algorithmic age because I mean, I guess it's nice that Elon Musk is just sort of declaring what he's going to do and there's not an algorithmic secrecy there, but generally a lot of companies hide their um, policy choices inside of technological um, systems. And so you do have to work to uncover them. And so I thought that I would just spend um, some time here talking about the lessons that I learned from doing this types of reporting. What does it take to audit an algorithm? So. The, mo the first and most important lesson um, is actually before you even start looking at an algorithm or trying to analyze it, which is to decide what to look at. You know, I think um, anyone who follows journalism knows that the choice of what story to write is actually as important maybe or more than the story itself because there's a million topics to cover. And if you only write about Donald Trump's tweets, then you really aren't writing about any of the other important issues in the world. And so um, I think that oftentimes most journalism like love secret new things, which is of course exciting, but I think the kinds of things that can be really important are really can often be hidden in plain sight. Allstate for instance, had been saying that they had this model. Amazon sellers have been complaining for years about the way that they were treated in search. And um, lawyers had been complaining for years about these um, criminal risk score algorithms. And all of those stories were out there. They were somewhat known. But what I think is important is that bringing math and data to the table made it much more salient to policymakers and made it something that they could have an argument about and wasn't just anecdotal evidence. I think another thing that's really important about data is that it's very tempting for to just grab a data set, look at it and start looking for a story. But actually that is sort of the road to ruin, I know because I've done that many times. And the reality is that if you don't have a hypothesis first, you're not going to get a good story. And so the hy hypothesis has to be something like, I've heard from lots of sellers that they're getting disadvantaged in search. What data would I need to support that? And then what can I do to build like a testable hypothesis? And that is just like all reporting starts with a tip or a hunch or some sort of information. I think data reporting, sometimes people get confused about whether it needs to start that way. And it absolutely does. It's also important to remember that data is political. Whoever collects it gets to organize it. And we've certainly learned that with Facebook when they um, have previously released data sets to academics, people have said, look, this data isn't useful. It doesn't tell us the things that we need to know about what's happening on the platform. And so, um, and that's true in all regards, right? Like there's a reason that there's no national database of police violence towards citizens because there's no political will to collect that information. And so that's why the Washington Post had to build their own database um, to, to capture that information and they won a Pulitzer for it as they should have. And so I think it's also really important to remember that like we always as journalists would love to get a nice data set from a think tank, but that is already gonna be curated to give us the answers that they want us to have. And so we often have to collect our own data, which is why I built a newsroom with engineers in it who could scrape large data sets for me. I think it's also important to remember that like journalism has a trust problem and we need to overcome that, right? The idea that you could just interview three people in a diner and say, this election is all about whatever that those people told you. Um, I mean, people still do those stories, but I think the public is really over it. They don't believe that anymore. That's one of the reasons or skepticism about journalism. And so I think it's important to think as journalists, like what is the right sample size that I that would allow me to declare some kind of finding? And of course, like with a, something like Amazon, right? You know, we scrape tens of thousands of search results, but it's a gigantic platform. And so there's no way for us to really know if that was the most representative sample. We did the best that we could, but it was a big enough sample that it meant that like 
this wasn't just a half-assed trend. And so I think that it's important to do the most that you possibly can, but also recognize that, you know, as journalists, we're never going to have the perfect sample size. I think one thing that is challenging about this type of work is the fact that it has to do with statistics. And um, statistics is just, um, it's often just hard to understand, particularly things like odds. You know, the odds of this happening are eight to one versus seven to one, which is sort of what the findings were for Am our Amazon investigation. And yet, I think that getting comfortable with risk and the calculations of risk is what we need in this algorithmic world because the systems that we're analyzing are risk measurement systems. Essentially, that's what they are built to do is to calculate risk and look at it and spit out some sort of number. And so in order to analyze those systems, we also need to like reverse engineer those risk calculations. And so it's a challenge as a journalist to write things that are like statistically literate, but they are, I think, something that we have to get more comfortable with in our journalism. That said, the, I do think that um, readers just don't want to read um, a bunch of numbers, except for some, and those people I love, and God bless them, but um, we do always need a story. And so one of the sad things about a lot of the investigations that I lead is that we might do six to nine months of analysis, data collection and analysis to get to a finding, and then we're not done. We're like, oh my gosh, now we have to find the story. And that's where, you know, I spent a month knocking on doors in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to find people, for instance, who had been scored by that criminal risk score algorithm and, you know, knocking on their door saying, do you remember being arrested? Do you remember them asking questions? Did you know you got a high risk score? And of course they were like, I don't know, I don't remember. Um, but without those stories of like the two people who were arrested for the same exact crime and one had a huge track record, he had been arrested multiple times for, um, for uh, theft and he got a low risk score as a white man. And there was a young black girl who had no um, felonies and just like a juvenile misdemeanor on her record who got an extremely high risk score, right? And without that sort of story, the findings about, you know, the false positive rates and the false negative rates is just not as compelling. And so this, the challenge for, for journalists is always to find a way to tell that story. I also think it's really important to know that journalists, um, we are not experts. You know, I am like, I've been covering technology for, I don't know, 25 years, maybe more. And yet I, I'm not an expert. I just, I know who to call to ask questions. And I think we have to be humble about our own role because particularly when it comes to statistical analysis, you know, I have a math degree, but that doesn't mean I'm a, a statistician. And so we actually set up a process that I liken to peer review, where we actually get experts to review our work and our methodologies before we publish them. And so I usually will get at least one statistician and then definitely you need people who are experts in the area. So criminal data is really different than like um, Amazon data. And so for the story on Amazon, we'd have people who had were sellers and people who were experts in Amazon search. And then they would advise us on like whether we had missed something in the way we were looking at the data. And so that process is sort of like an academic peer review. And then after we get all those reviews, we actually then go and do what I call adversarial review, which is bring the analysis to the company or the entity that we're um, writing about and give them all the data and, and our methodology and say, look, here's what we did. Please tell us where we're wrong. Because the reality is, we wanna know where we're wrong. We wanna know if we made a mistake. And so sometimes we find really important things that we got wrong in that, in that moment. And that is really helpful because that adversary has the most incentive to tell us that we're wrong. They, you know, they're, they want um, to find a hole in our analysis. And as of yet, no one has found a hole that 
collapse the analysis. In fact, most every time it's been something small that allowed me to just tweak and make it more accurate, but the findings always stood up. But if they came back and, and were convincing about why it was wrong, we would have to abandon the story and that would still be a good outcome because we're in the truth business. I think one thing that is really great about doing this type of data-driven journalism is the fact that we don't have to worry about this idea of objectivity. I grew up in a world of journalism that, you know, taught me that objectivity was the goal. And what that often meant was like, you got to have people on both sides and you call somebody on this side and that side of the story. And it's like, and over time, essentially that got gamed, right? So climate change is a perfect example of that, where, you know, I think 99.95% .95 of the scientific literature supports the idea that the earth is warming. And really the only questions are how fast and by what cause. And so the idea of presenting that as both sides is actually a false equivalence. And yet for a long time, that is what journalists were doing. And I think that luckily we have awoken as a profession and stopped doing as much of that, but I think that an even better next step is to find a way to talk about limitations. So what we do in our methodologies when I do these big investigations is we would write about what we found, you know, Amazon, we found this much of them, they're preferencing their own brands, et cetera. But we do the limitations, which is the limitations of our findings are we don't know if this is actually a representative sample. We did the best we could. Um, we don't know all the factors that they're using in their search criteria. We only tested the ones that we could see. You know, there's always things that you don't know. And I think that having, um, being really clear about that is actually just a really good way to build trust with the reader, which is like, here's what we know, here's what we don't know. You know, journalism is not the final take, right? We're the first draft of history. So it's okay for us to just say, this is what's known right now and we'll update you when we find more. I think it's also really important to show all of your work, right? So we have a habit of publishing methodologies, full data sets, often the code that we use to do our analysis, um, anything that we can provide, I think is um, really helpful for people who, you know, want to work with that data. There are people who find things in the data sets we've collected that we didn't find. And so we're contributing that to the public and allowing other people to do additional research. And also it is helpful because people will replicate our research, right? After the criminal risk score algorithm story ran, the company pushed back on it pretty hard, but many different um, academics reran the data, found the same things and, and validated our work. And so it ends up being helpful, I think, to journalists as well. And then finally, I would say the thing that um, journalists um, could do better and that I try to do is to keep going. <laughs> you know, it's easy to just do one story and then never cover a topic again. But the reality is that change in the world comes from sort of constant repetitive hitting on important topics, right? Think of gay marriage. That campaign went on for, for decades before the law was changed. And I think that's how change happens, is that a lot of dedicated people keep yelling about something or not yelling, putting important points and data across the table, saying why this thing would be a better thing for the world. And the thing that is really great about building a newsroom that is staffed with engineers and data scientists is that we can sometimes build tools to do automatic persistent monitoring. So one thing that we built at the markup was something called Blacklight, which is just a tool that we built for ourselves actually to try to analyze websites and see what creepy privacy techniques they were using. But then we realized we could open it up to the public and let anyone check any website for creepy behavior. And you can check it out on markup.org blacklight. Um, but since then, many different organizations have written reports like Human Rights Watch and others based on information that they collected on um, Blacklight. And so that is a way for us to continue to be watchdogs, but without having to actually write a story ourselves each time. So um, that is all I have um, from my presentation. I want to, I'm excited to talk to you guys and have questions. Um, so 
I had a number of different questions. I think you know your voice is so key to this conversation today, as I mentioned, in part because journalism is often the catalyst for policy change. Um, and I know you mentioned the uh, ProPublica story about uh, recidivism risk algorithms um, and the Amazon story and the House investigations. But I wanted to first ask, what, what are other big or biggest policy changes that you have seen occur as a result of your coverage of the tech sector? Well, maybe one of the bigger ones is the um, work that I did for many years about Facebook's um, discriminatory ad targeting uh, platform. So basically uh, in I think 2016, um, I noticed that Facebook had this ability to drop, have a drop down menu where you could target your ads and you could just say, I want to target to blacks, but then you could also say it had a drop down menu to not tar to block your ads from being seen. And so you could block your ads from being seen by different racial categories. And so then I thought, well, could you do that for housing ads? Because there's a law, the Fair Housing Act, that says you can't actually discriminate by race or all of other characteristics in housing ads. And I was able to buy an ad. And um, that was really shocking. So I wrote a story saying, like, I can't believe this. Then um, Facebook said they would invent a big algorithm to solve this problem. And I, I remember saying to them, I don't know, why don't you just get rid of the drop down that says, that says like block black people? And they were like, no, 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 that's not gonna solve. We're gonna build a big old algorithm, machine learning. It'll be really amazing. They launched it a couple months later. And then a few months after that, I was able to buy an ad again and get through their fancy algorithm. And by that point, I think HUD had started to sue them and they um, said, okay, now we're really going to work on it and do a better algorithm. And then they got sued by a group of housing groups, and did a big settlement and said, okay, we're really, really going to block them now because we have even a better algorithm. And then stuff just kept slipping through. And eventually, I think after four years, maybe five, they eventually got rid of the drop down menu. And so you can no longer use race characteristics in housing ads. And I mean, I have to say, this is like a really sad story that I'm telling you, like, this is some great win because this is truly just basic compliance with like an existing law, but that's what it takes to bring change sadly in today's world. Yeah. So, um, of these stories that you've mentioned where you've gotten some purchase from policymakers or responses from companies, what was sort of the magic of the moment? Like what in your view made it more likely that there would be a public response or a policy response to a story uh, in hindsight that you thought would be really important? And I guess conversely, have there been stories where you put something together and you expected a policy response and public outrage and then it you know, dropped out there and nothing ended up happening? Well, sadly, the latter is often the case. Um, we, you know, this is the, the thing that is really hard about being a journalist is you have to just believe that change will come and it might take a really long time. And it often that does not come the day you publish. Um, the times that it does happen are times that it's just totally egregious. Like the time that I wrote a story about how um, you could buy an ad targeted to the term Jew hater on Facebook. Um, it, it like pre-populated. So if you were like writing into the targeting category Jew, it would suggest hater. Um, so that like, they turned that off that afternoon, right? Cause that was just ridiculous. It went completely viral and um, people started trying all different, you know, Muslim hater, et cetera, et cetera. And so they had to turn off this whole thing that they had basically created a system that would just, no human ever looked at the ad categories. It just auto-generated from things people wrote in their profiles. So if pe enough people wrote in their profile that they were a Jew hater, it would be like, that must be an ad category. So, um, so sometimes when things are really egregious, you can get an immediate response. Um, to be completely candid, if you are in a brand name newspaper, the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, you're more likely to get a response. I did spend much of my career in those places. Um, 
But these days, you know, even at a small place like the markup, we can also get responses. And I think data is a big piece of it. This is why I'm such a believer in data journalism. I think that giving the evidence and then allowing other people to work with it, right? By putting the data set out there, it actually provides the policymakers something to do other than just say, I read a story and it said this, right? I think when the I read a story that said this works better when it's in the New York Times, right? So like if if it's Maggie Haberman and she's like inside the room and Donald Trump said this, people are like, okay, that probably happened because she's been right, you know. But if if you're talking about something algorithmic that's black box and confusing, you have to, I think, show your work. And so that's why I think that it's really important to put data out there because I think it allows for policy conversations to take place. I actually think this, despite the sort of major dysfunction we have in our policy worlds, I do think we are somewhat data driven. Like both sides do usually have to come up with some sort of data paper about why they, why their thing is better or not. And so if in an evidence driven world, the more evidence we can provide as journalists, I think the more we can inform a better public debate. I don't want to get depressing and say this all assumes that policymaking is actually evidence driven, uh, but I just did. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think I want, I want to revisit the second half of that question. Do you have examples of stories where, you know, you did put out something you thought would get policy purchase and it landed invisibly? I mean, unfortunately, that's so common that I'm actually having a hard time coming up with an example. But, um, you know, let me think about it. Um, some of the. Uh, there, there have been some stories like that. So well, here's a good one. So Amazon, um, we did a big investigation about how they had a list of products that they said they weren't going to sell like that were dead, deadly, essentially <laughs> things that would kill people. They had a list of called like deadly items you can't sell on um, Amazon. And the and this included like things like flammable material that could blow up your house or, you know, pill making machines that were being used to like make, you know, drugs that kill people. And um, they, um, we showed that they were not only selling them, but also talked to these people like this fire chief who was like, his daughter was killed in a fire by one of these like flammable things. And he had personally been writing to Amazon, you know, repeatedly saying like, you can't sell this stuff. And um, it was breaking Amazon's own rules. And there was like just so many reasons why this was a low hanging fruit and literally nothing happened. And then like three months after the story, all of it was back up and, you know, and this continues to happen. I mean, their journalists are constantly writing this story, right? Amazon continues to sell deathly things that themselves they have said they won't sell and there's no accountability. They're just, um, they just want to live in this world of we're just the platform and um, you know we just don't have any responsibility for what we sell which I have to say is just so it's so frustrating when you think about it because you know as a journalist I'm liable for every word we write and we get everything checked by lawyers which costs a fortune and then we have to get media liability insurance which costs a fortune and is impossible to get and less and fewer and fewer insurers want to offer it and so for me to be held so accountable for every little thing and then these giant companies have complete impunity I mean I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know but it's just incredibly unfair <laughs> yeah and hopefully we can revisit that in some discussions of CDA 230 on panels later today yeah. um I something struck me which actually was not one of the questions I was going to ask you but I think it plays into this a bit you know there's a little bit of what's going on here is that you're doing this vast data-driven mathematical journalism with the goal of producing evidence that can then be referred to by you know logical reasonable people um, and yet several times through this you've you've pointed out that like the hook matters right the the narrative matters the uh you know memification matters um and that seems to me to maybe be the hardest part of what you're doing, right? To take something that's so vast and evidence-driven and math 
uh, and turn it into the one sentence or the you know, two words that's actually gonna make it something that's easily digestible by people. Um, so to turn that sort of into a, a question, what does that process look like, right? Is it, is it the, you go and you do interviews and you find the individual human story and you say, ah, this is it, right? Like this, this, this encapsulates what I took out of the math. Um, or is it, you know, I guess sort of thinking about your audience and uh, what gets picked up on social media platforms, you know, possibly no longer Twitter uh, and, and what the hashtag looks like. Right. What is what is that process yeah, of yeah. translation from the big and the you know longitudinal to the small clip that's personalized and human? Yeah, that's the work. I mean, the thing that that is the traditional work of journalism, right? And it is um, hard, but there are a lot of like norms around it, right? And so, and not all of them are good, right? I mean, I actually don't know that we do really want human stories but the reality is that like particularly for these algorithmic harms like when we knock on the door and tell someone like our math says you were harmed by an algorithm they're like that seems bad like it's not you know it's not the most compelling human story but it's like sort of all we have to offer at the moment and um because the problem is you don't know right like that is the whole thing about algorithmic harm right the for, and we never could show right that there were housing ads that weren't shown to black people because how would you be able to prove that right it's hard to prove a negative and so the world that i operate in is a particularly challenging one for narrative and yet the reality is humans just love stories and so there's really kind of um we, we do just knock on a lot of doors. And, you know, one thing about journalism um, that I was just telling a young girl the other day, I was like, it just, it's just a huge amount of rejection. <laughs> it's so much rejection. You get 30 people saying, no, I'm not gonna talk to you for anyone that says yes. And of those, you know, not all of them are even at all related to the topic you wanna do. So it's a huge amount of work, but it is, like you said, the most important part, not, I don't know if I want to say the most important part, all of it's important, but it is, it's what gets you across the finish line. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also hearing, you know, other elements of this that are about, uh, to bring up something from the first panel about amplification, um, and you know, the, the role of not just different online platforms, but also, um, different journalism companies in choosing which of those stories to pick up and, and amplify. Um, so the second set of questions I had, which is appropriate because we're at a law school, is about the role of the law in this. And you know, I was reviewing your uh, ProPublica reporting on machine bias and noticed just how much open government law is there, right? You're reporting on an instrument that's built by a private company, but used in government. And much of the, the access was obtained through you know, either filing for open records requests uh, or going to the court system and seeing open you know, litigation records that were available to you there. Um, so what are the biggest practical hurdles and most frequent practical hurdles that you face when you're trying to get access? Um, and I guess I'm gonna rephrase my question from does the law matter, because I think I've answered it, uh, and plus I'm self-important and a law professor, to like, how does the law matter? When does the law matter? You know, when, it, when is it doing important work to get you the access to produce this kind of story? versus where is it missing uh, where you think it could be? Yeah, I mean, I've always sort of thought of investigative journalism as having like three legs um, of a stool that are like all three you need to do the work. And one is just incredible, you know, reporting, a willingness to talk to all the people who get rejected, still keep talking to more people. One leg of that stool is incredible legal support. You just really can't do serious investigative journalism without legal support. You need legal support for filing for public documents. You need legal support for what we did was, you know, collecting criminal records from a public website. Um, you know, that was scraping. It's scraping public data, but there are places that would come after you for violation of terms of service. So you need a, a legal, you know, you need someone who's willing to defend you on that. The other piece of the stool that I think is really important is, you know, the engineering and data talent to do the analysis and, um, and make sure that you have 
you're using computation and automation, these great skills to supercharge your investigative reporting. Because the reality is journalists are outnumbered, outspent, <laughs> outgunned on all fronts. And so I think we need to have every tool at our disposal. And I would say that legal backing is like the most, probably the most important one of those three. You really can't even get into the game without it. Yeah, and I think, um, so I'll just, I guess, summarize two, th two types of law that I heard you reference. One is open government law, right, which is kind of the, the meat and potatoes of traditional journalistic coverage of government entities. Um, and we have somebody who will be speaking on our next panel a bit about Colorado's open government law um, and the kinds of access that it, it allows versus the exceptions it contains. Um, then I heard you uh, mention scraping. Uh, and the legal firm framework for scraping is the uh, CFAA. Um, and so that's you know, an almost a different, entire different category of, of lawyering. Um, but now with data journalism or mathematical journalism, you know, that's, that's part of the transparency story too. Um, you know, I, I've been wondering because in some of the realms that I'm operating in, we're starting to think creatively, uh, or starting to hope to think creatively about the use of other kinds of transparency rights that exist over the private sector. Um, and I wonder the extent to which that might become a new sort of media law, right? Um, so you think about these privacy laws, data privacy laws that are being passed in multiple states, including our own, that include individualized notice requirements or individualized access requirements. Is there, you know, framing on the journalistic side of things that's thinking of like, hey, how could we use those points of access onto the private sector to do, you know, public interest stories that talk about the big picture. Oh yeah, I mean, this is something I'm very excited about is, you know, especially with California's um, access laws that are coming into play next year. Um, the EU has, has got a whole bunch of more access uh, laws coming out and I know Colorado. Um, and so there, those are the kinds of things where, you know, the dream is to get a lot of people to, do public requests about their own data and then use all of those pieces together to try to understand what's happening. Because the challenge of, this, of the world we're in, right? The world that we're in of algorithmic decision-making is that you and I are gonna get different decisions. We're gonna get different things at the top of our newsfeed. We're gonna get different decisions on which ads are shown to us. We're gonna get different, all sorts of things. And so in order to understand what's going on, you just, need a lot of data, right? This is why I started um, this national panel to analyze Facebook called Citizen Browser. Basically, we ended, I couldn't think of a way to, to hold Facebook accountable. And so without doing this, we've ended up doing a very expensive project, it would cost almost a million dollars, to set up a national panel of users who installed a tool that we built that let us analyze their feed. And we saw their Facebook news feed, we stripped out the data, uh, that was personally identifiable. And they just told us things that they chose to self-identify politically, age, gender, race, ge geography. And we used, that was the only identifying details we used. And that allowed us to do a, a year and a half worth of investigative stories about Facebook showing that repeatedly that they would make claims about how they were gonna not boost something in their algorithmic recommendations and then they would. And you need a huge panel of people to do that. now. If people could donate their data, which is essentially what you're talking about, which is these give access requests and then donate them, that would also be another way to build this kind of panel. The challenge with the donations is that um, I have done projects like that in, in the past. And often when you ask people to donate, the only people who are really motivated are usually a certain, your cl like closest readers, and they don't always represent like the full swath of the type of people that you would want to hear from to get a real representative view, which is why I ended up having to pay people to install this tool. But that said, um, it's, it's better than nothing and it's a great start. Yeah, I'm hearing a theme both with that and the you know, 30% of acceptance versus 70% rejection of, you know, your sample samples are really skewed in journalism, right? Um, so, uh, I guess the follow on question to that, we talked a little bit, or we heard a little bit in the panel this morning, and I think we'll hear more again in the last panel this afternoon 
um, about some of the dangers of creating um, public accountability or public transparency requirements for private companies. Uh, and so, you know, the, one of the counter arguments that we heard to provide access over, uh, say, content moderation policies for large internet platforms um, is that that can become a way to influence the substance of content moderation policies. Uh, it can, you know, effectively implicate First Amendment interests and even possibly, you know, First Amendment law. Um, and so, you know, when you're when you're thinking about this through your perspective as a as a mathematical journalist, I imagine that on the one hand, having more access to information held by these companies is delightful. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, in the current political environment, how much do you worry about transparency being weaponized against journalism? Um, and, you know, whether the the use of transparency to govern internet platforms is a canary in the coal mine for, you know, what potentially could be to come for newspapers and uh, magazines? Yeah, I mean, that's a challenging question. I think, um, I guess I am always sort of just going to be politically and temperamentally and professionally inclined towards more transparency. I think there are always going to be downsides and I um and I think you know I remember when I started um writing about privacy at the Wall Street Journal and a couple of my um colleagues came and said to me you know this is not good for journalists like if you push for privacy like we might get less transparency and less data and you should really back off and um and, you know I hear what they're saying right and I, I do still hear that from from journalists some time to time but I think in the end like when we're talking about hack platforms specifically which is what I think you're talking about we're we're talking about kind of the all public discourse and political discourse in the world right and that's pretty high stakes and so I think that um transparency is always going to have a double-edged sword. People will make different types of arguments, but in the end, um, I, ha I have to believe, I think as a journalist, I do have a sort of optimism that is not borne out <laughs> by the circumstances, right? Like I'm, I'm preternaturally optimistic despite the fact that like the world continues to show me reasons why I shouldn't be and so I do really believe that like so I have this belief like just for facts out people will actually do something and um and that's maybe naive but it is sort of my driving force so I have two more questions just to suggest to the audience that you start teeing up questions to ask um my first actually goes a little bit to what you were just mentioning of your coverage of privacy and the, the response you received about, you know, this will be bad for journalism. Um, let's say, you know, you hold the pen for making a law uh, and you decide that you're gonna skip through these sort of oblique ways of trying to get access to information that these companies have. And instead um, you actually are able to write a private sector FOIA right? You write an open government law, but it applies to the private sector. What might that look like? And what limitations would you want to place on it based on, you know, the other part of your experience of covering privacy and seeing uh, the implications of this for individual rights and dignity? Oh my God. I mean, seriously, that is like the dream. <laughs> I like I can't even like dare to dream like it's so hard to even get government FOIA responses private FOIA would be amazing right um I think like top of my wish list is stuff that is uh, the way I view it is in terms of public interest and high human stakes and so for instance I think that hiring algorithms those that decide whether you get a job or not through an automated system are so important. That is people's livelihoods being judged by machines that are unaccountable. And we don't know, are they complying with employment law, right? Is it discriminatory? There's no testing of it. There's not really any way. And so like, those are the kinds of things where I think you can make an argument that there's a public interest 
there's high human stakes and there's existing laws that you would want to know whether that, that cover this area. And so that's just me off the top of my head saying the things I would think would be the criteria for this. I am not a lawyer. I do not write laws. And so I, you know, I would want to consult with some people, but, um, but I would say that that is something that would be uh, amazing because I think I really, really worry about a world, right, which we're already in, where there's essentially a racialized underclass that is ruled by algorithms and automatic decision making. They are hired by an algorithm, their own daily life is overseen by it, they're fired by it, and they can't get out of this system. And it's preposterous that we allow this to happen, and it is um, only going to get worse. Uh, with that optimism, I have my <laughs> my last question. Um, yeah, tech policy conferences are you know always an upper. Um, my my last question is is uh, I think riffing off of something that Daphne did on the first panel today, which was uh, she talked about the shift in the conversation over platform transparency uh, from say ten years ago, from really being about accountability for government uh, and trying to give oversight about government surveillance and government takedown requests to now really being about accountability over platforms. Um, and I wondered if you could talk, since we're now approaching the 10th anniversary of Edward Snowden's leaks, um, about that arc, you know, it within as a backdrop to the work that you do. Um, you know, was that, have you seen a similar shift of the Snowden leaks highlighting government behavior to now a shift to looking at private actor behavior? Has it really all been part of the same story of you know, uh, complacency and, and job owning and uh, you know, interaction between these two companies and government? What, is your, what are your thoughts on that 10 years ago versus now? I mean, it's such a good question because um, as, as a person who has covered tech for decades, grew up in Silicon Valley, um, and I think probably is considered a tech critic, right? I actually want to say that, you know, the tech companies, um, even to this day are doing some heroic work, resisting government requests, particularly in countries like India and repressive regimes where they want to use this information to crack down on dissidents. And so it is a double-edged sword, right? They are trying in some cases, like, and I think Twitter was doing quite um, some heroic stuff in India recently, um, to hold the line for free speech. And I think that that's something that has to be commended. And that's one of the things that's so difficult about the tech platforms, because in one way, we want them, like the beauty of them transcending all of the laws of every nation is this great promise that you could override authoritarian regimes with this unstoppable force, right? This is sort of the dream of the early days. And then, you know, the reality is that once you have a global corporate superpower that is unregulatable by any government, that's also a problem. <laughs> and so, you know, I think we've kind of reached that point where it was like before they were a little bit more scrappy fighting for us against government surveillance. And now we realize, oh my gosh, they're the government. I mean, not really, but in some ways if they regulate, they can choose who the election is, right? Like they're, if, if Facebook wanted to just turn off all Republican advertising or all Democratic advertising, like, you know, they could, they literally could. Right. And so, you know, I hope they're not going to, but like, we are at a stage where their power is so massive that it makes sense for us to look at them in a more skeptical and more wary um, way than we were in the past. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's Kristen Eikenser who refers to tech companies as digital Switzerland's, right? Um, <laughs> the sort of they're they're not of a country, and that they are influenced by geopolitical power. Um, all right, so I think my time talking is done, and I turn it over to our audience. And again, we invoke the Phil Weiser rule to start with a question from a student. Blake is trying to point it, I think, at Richard. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah, but my job is just to deliver the microphone, but I can ask you a question too. Um, 
Thanks so much for talking with us today. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm curious your thoughts on the business influence of journalism right now. I mean, obviously content moderation decisions are, you know, regardless of the double speak, motivated by profit, right? They need to figure out what's best for their bottom line. How do you feel that journalism today is influenced by money? Oh, well, because we have no money, so this is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, journalism in the U.S. has gone from a $30 billion a year revenue 20 years ago to $10 billion. Um, That's a huge drop. Um, and it's, uh, my, this industry is cratering, right? It literally is cratering it as a for-profit revenue generating business, which is why I started a nonprofit. You know, and that's great, um, but it also, there aren't a lot of billionaires out there wanting to fund um, nonprofit journalism. And and the reality is you have to attach yourself to a billionaire. <laughs> so I happen to have a nice one, Craig Newmark, but like the reality is like, that's the world and that is messed up, right? Like there is, um, there's a crisis in journalism. And what it means is that we're as an industry, rather weak, right? Like a journalistic outlet is going to take the cautious move because they don't want to lose their media liability insurance or their lawyers are going to say, you know what, just don't take the risk. Like it's not worth it. And so what it means is journalism as a whole, and I'm not naming anyone specifically, but as a whole, we become more cautious. You have to, that is the business imperative of an industry on decline in a massive decline with future revenue is constantly plummeting, you're going to be risk averse. And so that is a problem for not just journalism, but for democracy. I have a question over here from Eric Lim. We're coordinating microphones. Give us one second. Hey, Julia, it's Eric Goldman. Nice to see you. Um, Hi. So, uh, I mean, I'll read any story you write. Uh, you obviously are at the top of your game, um, but not every journalist is as good as you. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the risks that poses, especially with what you're defining as mathematics journalism. When I heard that, the first thing I thought was lies, damn lies, and statistics, that most of the people who are going to be trying to do what you do won't do it as well. And many of them, especially as you talked about getting rid of objectivity, will actually have a normative agenda to try and use statistics to show whatever they're trying to advance. Um, what are we going to do about that? You've already solved the problem for you because you built these really industrial grade systems. But what are we going to do about the rest of the people who can't do what you do? I mean, that's a great question, Eric. And I think it has to do with the structures of journalism, right? It's just, I think we have to admit as a society that um, journalism is essential to democracy and we have to think of a way to save it. I have personally sort of been, I think that the idea of taxing companies and using that money into some sort of fund that supports journalism is a good idea. I think um, I'm not a huge fan of these plans where the journalists we all have to arm wrestle with Facebook for licensing fees because that feels very weird to do, um, especially for a small newsroom like mine. Um, but I think that it's hard to build quality inside of a cratering business that is dependent on clicks. To, and so means the journalists have to write seven stories a day. Yeah, they can't do statistical analysis. They have to write so many hot takes to get those clicks, to get that very pennies of ad revenue for those behaviorally driven ads. Now, I would say there's one thing that would fix some of this, which is not having behaviorally driven ads. Because the fact is that back in the day, advertisers wanted to advertise next to quality content because that's where they thought the quality readers were. And those quality readers are still there, but they can find them cheaper on some other website because they track them. And so I know this is heresy, but I still sort of think like we could sort of address this by saying, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth it to have all the ads following you around if it means that 
journalism is defunded and democracy is destabilized. Like, I don't know, maybe not. Yeah, I, when I hear Eric's comment or Eric's question, I think of two things immediately. One is that you get into sort of this endless cycle of auditing, right? Like you have the journalists auditing the companies and then being audited by other journalists and wow, auditors, that'd be a good career move right now. Um, <laughs> the, the other thought that I had, and this is mainly just trolling Eric from the mic is uh, how about <laughs> accuracy requirements? Anyway, um, <laughs> so any additional questions from the members of our audience? I see one down here. Hi, thank you, Julia, for coming. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, that you spoke to a group of girls about their about their journalism, um, and I was wondering if you see any trends in academia or in the education of future journalists to utilize um, statistical regressions or analysis. Uh, it's there's a lot of literacy in education that has to come with learning that skill, um, and I'm just. Curious if you see that as a trend that's um, becoming more popular. Oh, I definitely do. I mean, I think I have a skewed uh, view of it because I think people like that are attracted to me. And so I hear from a lot of them. But um, what I hear a lot is actually that a lot of um, statisticians, data scientists, programmers are looking for more mission-driven work and actually really excited about the idea of contributing in newsrooms. And a lot of newsrooms just don't know how to use them. They, because the people who run them are not literate in that, they don't necessarily know how to best utilize that skill. And I think the real talent that I have brought is just that because I was a programmer and grew up in a family of programmers that I'm not scared of them. I know how to talk to them. That's literally my only sort of skill is just, I'm like able to be biliterate in like journalism speak and programmers speak. And I, so I find a real excitement in the computer science community in general to participate in this type of work. And the challenge I have is finding journalists who can also communicate with them directly. And so that, but that's teachable. And I, a lot of the journalists in my newsroom have um, started off really illiterate in all of that. And by the end, they're like programming and like super into it. And so I think it's totally learnable. And I think both sides benefit, both um, the journalists and the data um, scientists, both get more empathy for each other and the work that the other one does through these types of partnerships. And so I have great hope for it, but obviously, um, as Eric said, I'm essentially an outlier <laughs> in the industry. Thank you. Hi, um, I just had a quick question, a quick follow-up. Um, so in our last panel, we had um, a little bit of a discussion on the role of platforms as educators in content moderation for users. Um, and I know you mentioned that um, algorithmic harms tend to be really hard to humanize when you're going door to door and talking to people and they have kind of a reaction like, oh, well, that sounds bad, I guess. Um, do you see any part of your role as an education role when you're having those conversations with individuals that might not recognize algorithmic harms? Absolutely. I mean, I think journalists in general have an educational role and I, I wish that I've had more time and energy to devote to it um, because I think that that is our job. One of the things that, um, I feel really strongly about is that our job is not just to uncover things, but it's to explain things that aren't secret, right? So some of the stories that we do are just very explanatory. And, um, and I've always done that throughout my career because I really think that oftentimes um, the, the way the world works is not well described and um, is, is actually pretty shocking. Just like, um, you know, Broadband is a really good example, right? The idea that there are um, dozens of states where there are laws that prevent municipalities from putting in their own broadband because the telecom companies have lobbied to say that like no one can compete with us. And so that no one, no cities can offer like 
in those states can offer their own cheaper, faster broadband. That's not a secret, but it's still really important to tell people about. And so I really believe that that's the educational role, which is like, okay, here's just a fact that is out there that you should know about. And similarly with algorithmic harm, I think that is also um, something that is important to educate people about. People have a little sense of it because of their Facebook feed, right? They're like, oh, I had a post taken down or something. So people have, a, or, or I saw something that I didn't wanna see. So there's, I think some level of education through content moderation has sensitized people to this idea. But, um, but there's so much more to be done. I mean, so much of the work that we've done at the markup has not been about big tech. We've written about mortgage approval algorithms and how they're racially biased. We've written about tenant screening algorithms. You know, there's a lot that uh, basically tech is just um, a layer that every industry uses to hide their tracks, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, so another theme I'm hearing emerge is the news as things that are not new. Uh, so using, yes. yeah, using explanations and, um, you know, using data that's already there, they're already there uh, to really highlight what's already happening instead of being drawn to the shiny thing. Um, I think we have one more time or one more time for one more question uh, before we are all released to lunch. First, thanks very much for, for being here today. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, your identification within Facebook of the drop down allowing people to discriminate against uh, people based on an ethnic class. Um, I was wondering if in other cases your team have tried to reverse engineer some of the algorithms that that have led to uh, discriminatory behavior. Such as with the with the um, uh, the data about you know whether or not somebody's more likely to be recidivative, uh, et cetera. Oh uh, yeah, we do a lot of uh, reporting on um, on racial bias because it's endemic in all the systems that we end up looking at. So um, we uh, recently did an analysis of broadband speeds and showed that you know a lot of companies um, sell. Uh, one, they have one price for broadband, 50, you know, 40 to $60 a month for home broadband. Um, and they'll offer it flat across a city, but the speeds that they offer are very, and some of them are below what the FCC even calls broadband. So we looked at where are the neighborhoods that are getting the slow speeds, but paying the high, you know, the same price as the neighborhoods getting the high speeds. Well, just take a wild guess what kind of neighborhoods we're getting, <laughs> you know, the slow speeds and which are getting the high speeds. Well, the low income and black and brown neighborhoods were the ones predominantly getting the low speeds, but paying the, the same price as the as the people in the richer neighborhoods getting the 200 megabits, you know. And so we do that type of analysis quite often because um, a lot of this um, information is it's hard to you have to join two different data sets, right? You have to take scrape all the data from all the broadband providers about what they say they offer. And by the way, this was an analysis just of what they say they offer, not even what they actually, we didn't test the actual speed. So like, let's, it's obviously worse. And then overlay that with census data and you see that there's a pattern. We did the same thing with predictive policing. We found a data set that this predictive policing company had left unsecured on a website and um, we scraped it all. And it was like 40 million um, predictive policing things where they said, okay, a crime's gonna happen here in the next two hours, which is how they do their predictive policing. So we went and looked and saw what neighborhoods are they sending these patrol cars into? And it was very rarely white neighborhoods. Um, and so this is the type of analysis that we regularly do because it's really important to understand what, um, you know, we have a real history of structural racism in this country. And so what are the ways that we're embedding that into these computer systems? Um, it probably, I would hope inadvertently, but I think it's important to expose it. Right, but my question was more about have your, has your team gone in and trying to build or reverse engineer the algorithms that determine where they're gonna oh. send the police, yeah. Oh yeah, so I mean, I think reverse engineering an algorithm is, um, you know, it probably could be done, um, but I, I don't know that that's our role. 
our role is to show the impact on humans in the world, right? So we're, we're basically saying, this is where you sent your cars. And we don't have access to the algorithm and we don't have access to the inputs. And so we would be making a lot of guesses and trying to show what that model might be. And that's important work. But I do try to steer clear of the speculative as much as possible. I mean, I'm okay with probabilistic findings, but I think that the reality is just like anything else in life, you're responsible for the outcomes. You made a product and this is the outcome. And so we are the per people who are outcome focused, right? Here's where your outcomes were. You should explain to the world why that's totally fine, right? I think there are other people in the world who are better at building these predictive models and reverse engineering them. And I think that's also important work. I'm not sure I wouldn't say would never do it, but it's just not sure how it fits into our mandate, given that it's already takes us a year to do the outcome analysis. Everyone would please join me in thanking Julia for joining us. Thank you all. This was so fun.